So, yeah, the person of Jesus. Um, as we approach Easter, we're getting near um, to the final, well, we're right in the final hours leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And we're reading a passage today which is very wonderful. It's a very famous passage. It's the story of Jesus in Gethsemane. It's been the subject of many, many sermons and paintings. Um, it's a very wonderful, very deep and moving passage. Um, but it's also a very puzzling passage. And Christians throughout Christian history have found themselves deeply perplexed um, by what they see happening in Gethsemane. So let's read it um, first of all. So we're going to start chapter 14, verse 27. Um, this is now Jesus' fourth um, explicit prediction to the disciples of what's going to happen to him. Verse 27, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come, look. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Great. So it's a very wonderful, very deep passage. But as I said, it's a puzzling one. And actually, I think we can go further than that. Um, because this passage and the events it describes must not just have been puzzling. They must have been deeply awkward and rather embarrassing um, for certainly the early Christians, as they were launching their movement, as they were declaring these stories, these stories are ones which would have been difficult for them to get across. I want us to see three points today. I want us to see in this story proof of the pain and the prayers. First of all, the proof. So the reason it's embarrassing. There's a few reasons, but the first one to look at is what we see of Peter. Um, the other disciples as well, but especially what we see of Peter. So Jesus quotes this prophecy from Zechariah about how God will strike down his appointed king in judgment and all his people, the king's people, will scatter like sheep. And Jesus says that that's about us. That's about me. I'm the shepherd and you're the sheep. And as I get struck down, you're all going to fall away. You're all going to fall away. But Peter, he challenges Jesus. He's done this before, hasn't he? Last time in chapter 8, he challenged Jesus on his claim that he was going to die. But that, that didn't work out so well for Peter. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. This time, Peter lets that pass, but he jumps on this claim that they're all going to fall away. And he says here, he says, I'm not going to fall away. And right, right in the middle of the disciples... 
He says, even though all of these will fall away, I won't. He's saying, they don't love you like I love you, Jesus. I'm going to stay faithful to you. I'm never going to fall away. And Jesus kind of says to Peter, Peter, you, you don't really want to say this. You are going to fall away. But then Peter ratches it up a whole other level. And he says, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And as you probably know, that never didn't really mean never, because you literally just need to turn the page. And we see that in a matter of hours, Peter was doing exactly that. And Mark tells the story so poignantly because he has Jesus there on trial. And he's there in front of the whole Sanhedrin, calmly declaring the truth of who he is, the truth that will lead to him being beaten and spat at and condemned to die. And then Mark kind of shifts the focus to Peter just outside in the courtyard. And whereas Jesus was in front of the whole Sanhedrin being questioned, Peter was there in the courtyard being questioned by a mere servant girl. And whereas Jesus was true to his testimony, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. Not just once, three times. We see him calling down curses. Possibly commentators think he was even trying to prove that he did not know Jesus by cursing him. Because no disciple would ever curse their master. So it's a really, really spectacular fail. And the point I want to make about this is proof Proof is too strong. I just chose proof because I began with P. Um, but really, this is a very strong argument that what we see in the Gospels actually happened. That these aren't legends. That this is something that actually took place. People often say, don't they, that history is written by the winners. And basically, what we have in the Gospels is the story of the winners. This is the church's attempt to validate itself, the church's attempt to kind of build up authority for its leaders. They're kind of, ultimately, their PR material. You can't really trust them. But you see, don't you, that if this was PR material, you would not have this story in it. You wouldn't put this in. This spectacular failure of probably the most significant leader in the church. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make this story up if it didn't happen. It's too awkward. It's too embarrassing. But actually, you can go even further than that. You can make a very strong case that this story, this account, goes right back to Peter himself. One scholar argues, he said, no one in the early church would have dared or wished to highlight the weakness and failure of the revered apostle with the candor Mark's narrative does unless it came from Peter himself. It's a good argument. It's a very powerful argument that this stuff isn't just legend. This stuff actually happened. So Peter's failure is awkward but there's something else that's troubled and puzzled Christians. And actually, you could make exactly the same point um, again about what we see happening to Jesus. Again, this isn't something you'd want to make up. Because what we see Mark clearly portraying is Jesus in utter turmoil at his approaching death. Can we see this in verse 32 and 33? Up until now, Jesus has been completely in control. You see him in chapter 10 resolute as he turns his face towards Jerusalem. The disciples were dismayed, astonished, but Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. He was determined, he was calm, he was not wavering. But now, suddenly, quite suddenly, something changes. Verse 32, he goes into Gethsemane, he took the disciples, he said, sit here while I pray. And then it says, and he began to take Peter and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. 
This is a slightly bland translation because these are extremely strong and violent emotions that are being described. The word translated troubled means to experience horror and anguish. And deeply distressed is probably even more amazing because it says it means being alarmed or in shock. What is more amazing than that? That Jesus, the Son of God, the one who predicted his own death, suddenly finds himself in shock. This is someone who is so self-assured that he fell asleep on a boat in the middle of a storm and simply told the waves to be still and they obeyed. It is someone who is so unfazed by the fact of death that he said to a girl's corpse, little girl, wake up, it's time for breakfast. And she did. Someone who throughout has been clear-eyed and resolute about what awaits him, what he's here for, what his mission is. And yet here, he's in shock. He's completely in horror. It says he's overwhelmed to the point of death. What we see here is Jesus not coping. He's falling apart. He's overwhelmed to the point of death. He's having a near breakdown. Luke tells us he's hemorrhaging. As he says, his sweat fell like drops of blood to the ground. And so this is very unsettling and distressing. And you can imagine how it would have felt to the disciples but it's troubling for us as well, isn't it? John Stott, in writing about this, makes this point. He says, why did Jesus recoil from his death when so many Christian martyrs have gone after him with such courage? There's a famous old book called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it's a massive book. It literally counts thousands of these stories of how Christians died for their faith. The Wikipedia article said it's so big it weighed the same as a small infant. Um, and it's a good book to get if you like often quite inspirational but also very detailed and graphic accounts of exactly how people died um, for Jesus. Um, but one of the common features of these stories is how again and again Christians throughout history have died with great composure, great courage, even joy in singing. One famous one is of Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, who died at the stake in Oxford in 1555. And the Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us that as the faggots were being lit at their feet, Latimer cries out, Be of good cheer, Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light up such a candle in England as we'll never put out. And so you see the question, don't you? Why is Jesus facing his death with so much less composure than his later followers who died for his name? And the answer has to be this. It must be that he was facing something that all of those others weren't facing. What he was facing was something worse than death, something worse than physical torture by crucifixion. And at this moment, he got a taste of it. He told his disciples again and again what he had to do. This wasn't new information, but at this moment, at this moment, he had this foretaste that sent him reeling. I remember once walking up to a massive bonfire. You know it's going to be hot, but it's only as you get near it you start to feel the heat, its intensity, its unbearability. And here Jesus gets a taste of something he knew was going to happen. And there's two things that I think we need to think about here. First of all, what it was he was getting a foretaste of, obviously, if it wasn't just his physical suffering. But also, why? Why was he given this taste ahead of time? What was it? Well, we don't actually have to guess. Jesus prays specifically about what it was that overwhelmed him. It was, he says, the cup. He says, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. 
this cup, there's an immediacy about what he's praying. He knew the cup was coming. He's talked about it already with Peter and James and John. Can you drink the cup I've got to drink? But now it's here. It's in front of him. He's being invited by his father to drink it down to its dregs. And as he looks into the cup, he recoils and he staggers. What was it? Well, actually, the cup is a very, very familiar Old Testament imagery. It's something that would provoke, evoke something immediately in the minds of the disciples as he talks about the cup, because it's very prominent. It'd be like me saying, I have a dream. You know exactly what I'm referring to, Martin Luther's speech. So when he talks about the cup, it's a symbol for God's wrath against human evil and his judgment poured out on injustice. Let me read you some passages. Job 21, 20. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink the cup of the wrath of the Almighty. Psalm 75. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Or Isaiah 51, 17. Awake, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes people stagger. Or Jeremiah 25. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations drink it. And when they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So this is what Jesus was shrinking back from. Again, John Stott, this was not Jesus shrinking from death or an experience of pain, but death as a penalty for sin. Not physical death at the hands of men, but spiritual death at the hand of his father. Not the nails that would tear his flesh, but the sins he would bear upon his soul. Not the disciples that would forsake him, but the far worse experience of being forsaken, which would cause him to speak the words of Psalm 22 from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so this is what Jesus was facing, what Jesus was shrinking from. And what we see here, um, this is one another commentator puts it like this, he says, what we see here is the horror of the one who lives wholly for the Father. Remember Jesus' word, Abba? Only Jesus used this word to describe God. This amazingly intimate, this amazingly familiar word for God. Before Jesus, no one called God Abba. He says, Abba, Father, this is the horror of one who lives wholly for the Father, shuddering at the prospect of alienation from God, which is entailed in the sin upon which Jesus will take the judgment. He goes on, he says, Jesus came to his Father for refuge, for solace, for comfort in this brief last moment before he was betrayed but found hell rather than heaven opening before him, and he staggered. I don't know what you feel about this. I think most of us would recognize that in a world as messed up as ours, if God wasn't angry at what we see around us in the world, he would not be a loving God. In fact, my experience is that the more I love someone, the more angry I feel when they are hurt or abused. I feel angry at seeing wives and children fleeing from Ukraine, but I know I'd feel even more angry if it was my wife and my daughters fleeing. But what maybe we don't see as much is that it's not just the world out there 
that provokes God's anger. It's our own lives. And it's this we need to grapple with. Because actually the Bible says of all of us that we deserve hell and God's wrath. Hell is ultimately an absolute alienation from God. God is the source of all that is good and life-giving. He holds everything together. And that's true whether we acknowledge him or not. A person who lives in a cave all their life has never seen the sun still depends every second of every day for the fact the sun is in the sky. And when we sin, we're alienating ourselves from our very life source. We're saying, I don't acknowledge you. I'm the center of my world, not you. And you see, that's not a stable situation. And God says he's not going to shield us from the consequences of that forever. And though we look around and we see the kind of unraveling, some of the consequences of our self-destructive, self-centeredness around us in the world today, the Bible says that's nothing. We're still living with the sun in the sky. We're still living under God's grace. But what we see here, as Jesus looks into the cup, is Jesus tasting all of the spiritual darkness, all the disintegration, all the God-forsaken aloneness, all that we deserve. It opens up before him, and he staggers. So that's, that's what it is. But the second question is why? Why was he given this foretaste? Remember, this is sudden. He's astonished. He began, it suddenly hit him. It kind of breaks in on him. And we see, and we will see in a moment, that he breaks through it as well. He recovers his calm, his resolution. But for a moment, he's overwhelmed. It breaks in on him. Why did that God allow that to happen? I wouldn't have thought of this question myself, but it's a question that Jonathan Edwards asked in a very famous sermon called Christ's Agony. And it's really helpful to think about why this foretaste was given, why God didn't just wait for the cross. It's quite risky, isn't it? Jesus is alone in the garden. There's no soldiers around. His disciples are asleep. And he's suddenly given this taste of what he's got to go through. He could at this moment, fade away quietly into the night. Why show Jesus what it's going to be like? Jonathan Edwards, he puts it like this. He said, God brought him and set him at the mouth of the furnace that he might look in and stand and view its fierce and raging flames and see where he was going so that he would voluntarily enter into it and bear it for sinners. It was so that Jesus could choose to do it for us. Jesus consulted with his father, and he asked, is there another way? Do you see? Is there another way to do what? Is there another way to save people like you and me? This hell this hell we deserve. Is there another way to save them from this hell that I am looking at in the cup, this hell that I don't deserve but now have a taste of? And the question is, will he take it? Is his love for you and me strong enough? And that's why he had to taste it. So we could see that he chose to do this for you and me voluntarily in full knowledge of the cost. Jonathan Edwards again, he says, The anguish of Christ's soul caused him to sweat blood, but his love to his enemies, poor and unworthy as they were, was stronger still. The heart of Christ at that time was full of distress, but it was fuller of love to sinners such as you and I. His sorrows abounded, but his love did much more abound. Jesus said, not my will, but yours, Father, because he saw that there was no other way and he would rather lose himself than lose us. We could finish there and worship God, but there's one more thing we need to explore, and that's the prayer. We've seen the proof, the pain, and now the prayer. 
We've been talking throughout this series about the way of Jesus and looking at how we follow him along the way. But the disciples, and we at this moment, we kind of drop behind. We're left outside because this is a way that Jesus has to go alone. But as we go through the story, we see there is a call on the disciples because as we know and we've seen, they have their own trial. The shepherd is struck and the sheep are scattered. So both Jesus and both the disciples have a trial. Both would be tempted and both knew this. And Jesus warned them very plainly that they need to prepare for the trial. And so we see in this passage as well how they prepared for the trial. And we see that Jesus prayed and the disciples slept. Jesus prayed and the disciples slept. You see, Jesus prayed. He says to them, pray that you do not fall into temptation. And then it says, and he went away and prayed the same prayer again. Originally, I thought that he was being asked again to take, for the cup to be taken away. But I think actually he's now, and this aligns better with Luke's account as well. He's got through that moment, and now he's praying that he will be able to see it through, that he won't fall into temptation, that he will be able to see the trial through. And we know that Jesus' prayer was answered, almost as amazing and remarkable as the anguish we see in the garden is the serenity and resolution we see afterwards. Jesus prayed and was answered. We see him go on. At the end of the story, we see him, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. He's almost eager to get on with the job. He's prayed and he's overcome. He's found the strength. But what about the disciples? The disciples, as we know, were completely unprepared. They all fell away, and the reason was they slept. Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation but they slept. Jesus knew they would never stand for him if they did not pray, but they slept. And what did Jesus do? He woke them up. He said, now's not the time for sleep. Now's not the time for sleeping. Now's the time for praying. Don't sleep, pray. But they didn't. Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus overcame. Where did Jesus get his courage from? He prayed. Why did the disciples fail him so terribly? They slept. There's some great mysteries in this passage, but I don't think this is one of them. So what are your battles? Maybe you're the only Christian in your workplace or your family. Maybe you're tempted to deny Jesus or be silent. Maybe you're beset by some fierce temptation or jealousy of pride, lust, anger. Maybe you've had a secret frustration and problem no one knows about. Maybe you've been struggling with something for years and years. Do we sleep? We ought to be praying. The Bible says those who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Jesus' prayer was answered. He saw it through. He prayed and he saw it through. And if we pray for strength, we can be sure that our prayer will be answered too. We really can. Why? And I just want to see one more thing. First of all, we've just seen why, why we need to pray, but we also can see why we can pray in the first place. You see, Jesus isn't just an example in prayer. He's our power in prayer. He's why we can pray. We know when we get on our knees and pray, we will always be welcome because if we will belong to Jesus, we will never go through what Jesus went through. Jesus came to the Father for comfort and was forsaken. Jesus opened his heart in prayer and got hell. That's never happened to anyone before, and it won't happen to us because he went through it for us. Whenever we pray, God will welcome us with open arms. He will never forsake us. 
He will galvanise heaven for us. He will renew our strength. And the things that stop us from praying as we think about this lose our grip. Remember what Jesus chose to do for you in the garden. Are you feeling guilty? Do you think God's given up on you? If he didn't give up on you when hell itself was pouring into his heart, he won't give up on you now. Are you feeling like God's abandoned you? You're wrong. If he didn't abandon you then, when he was facing hell, why would he abandon you now? Are you feeling a failure or a hypocrite or a coward or worthless? Do you really think you can do anything to break Christ's love, a love that is this strong? Jesus says to us, hands off my treasure. I faced hell for you. I will tell you what value you are to me. This is why we should pray and this is why we can pray. So let's get over ourselves. Let's look at Jesus in the garden and let's pray. We worship and praise you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to go through this for us. We may not know, we cannot tell what pains you had to bear, but we believe it was for us you hung and suffered there. Thank you that you chose to do this for us. Thank you that you won that victory. Thank you that you overcame in prayer. May we live in your victory, may we rest in your love, and may we follow your example. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.